Hello and welcome to In Conversation With, the monthly podcast series brought to you by the team that produced the Global Cosmetics Newsfeed. 2023's theme is Circular Cosmetics. This month's topic is fragrance, and I'm your host, Siobhan Murphy. In an era of sustainability, the fragrance industry is making waves by turning to eco-friendly circular solutions that captivate our senses and respect our planet. From bottles designed for reuse to scents derived from regenerative ingredients, this month we will explore the innovations and inspirations behind this transformative movement. But first, let me introduce our panel. Welcome back to Nick Fass, Partner and Creative Director at Free the Birds, and a warm welcome to Francis Schumat, Founder and CEO at Able. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. So good to be here. Yeah, lovely to be having this conversation, Siobhan. Okay, Nick, let's start with you. What are the consumer challenges and where are the opportunities that Free the Bird have identified for circular fragrance products? It's such a good question. I think there's so much talk and so much insight around fragrances at the moment. I think the challenge that we have as consumers, we look at natural versus synthetic. And I think that we always, as consumers, just completely automatic pilot think naturally is best. Actually, it's not. But where I think there's such a great opportunity is thinking about the upcycling and the circular aspect of fragrance. And I think that's the story that we can really un unpick and tell with consumers. I think that's the really interesting insights that this is the way in, whereas before, when you're talking about synthetic versus natural, it doesn't resonate with consumers. But talking about upcycling, talking about more circular approach to fragrances, I think that is where the opportunity lies. And it's something that we can all identify as consumers. It's something that we can build on. It's something that we can actually digest in a much more easy way to consume our fragrances. And Francis, what are the consumer challenges that, a that Abel faces? Yeah, I think what Nick touched on around it being confusing for customers, I think is really interesting. You know, we don't buy perfume. It's not a functional, practical product. It's something that we, we buy and use to bring joy to our lives. So I think people approach that whole consumer process a little bit differently to they would other beauty products. And so there's this emotional tie with fragrance and that's what makes it such a wonderful medium to, to work with. And so as a brand for us, sustainability, natural, obviously, uh, we work with only plant derived, a lot of biotech as well. So there's also a lot of really interesting stuff happening at the cutting edge. I think of the fragrance industry is really what's happening in biotech and natural science. But how can we make that a message that a customer cares about? That when they're wearing perfume to feel beautiful and feel good. I think that's probably the biggest challenge is reconciling what we want to do as a business and where we need to go as an industry with a consumer product that really is all about beauty and joy and, and feeling good. So Nick, can you shed some light on the technical challenges and the opportunities that Free the Bird have noticed for circular fragrance products? Absolutely. I, I think that quality and control is absolutely stemmed to the, the fragrances. I think there's the consistency that we need to actually absolutely get through. There's the challenges with recycling, as we know from particularly from the UK perspective. And I think there's challenges in finding the right materials for you and your brand and also keeping those costs down. I think there's a, such a swirl at the moment of price and really thinking about what's better for the environment versus your profit. I think they're, they're the challenges that really are falling around um, the whole of the circular fragrance right now. And Francis, you touched on biotech. What are the technical challenges at ABLE? Yeah, again, I probably think, and like Nick, it's good to separate it out by the perfume and the packaging. They're completely different elements, but equally important. Uh, we've been working with purely plant-derived now for about 12 years. And I say that because it really is a different beast. So we work with master perfumers at Abel who spend most of their times working largely with synthetics. And so 
learning to work with naturals only um, and with these biotech ingredients it's an extension let's say of their repertoire and so I think we've certainly noticed as a brand how much better we've got it working with these ingredients you don't have the same tools in your toolbox as some perfumers that perhaps you were accustomed to so I think technically there's that and there's also and meeting customers' expectations um, around things like longevity and um, silage when you know, perhaps they're used to very heavy, overt synthetic fragrances. So again, it's just uh, finding that balance in between how much can we achieve because I think what we're achieving now with naturals and biotech um, is incredible. Very rarely does someone smell our perfume and think it's natural. So I think we, it's coming a long way. But that's re really exciting territory for me. And I think that's moving very quickly. Um, from a packaging perspective, yeah, Nick, you talked about recyclability and, and full life cycle. Uh, I think for small brands like ourselves who work globally, you know, we're selling in around 25, 30 countries. Um, with a, just a total myriad of recycling laws and rules and customs and practices. What's recyclable in Japan may not be recyclable in not just the US full stop, but state by state that varies. And so I think there's a lot of room for improvement on that front as an industry. I think the bigger players have a real role to play there and they can pave the way in, in, the way, in a way that smaller brands can't. And we can you know, get out there and force the change a little bit, but I think ultimately um, it has to happen at scale. Uh, so I really hope to see that coming. And I think we're seeing some really positive signs there, but technically there'll always be challenges and there's so much nuance, right? I get my heckles up when I hear this is better than that. It, there's just so much nuance. Is it carbon footprint we're looking at? Is it biodegradability? Is it um, where did it start its life? Is it petrochemical derived and non-renewable resource? If it's a bioplastic, what does the end of life look like? So I think maybe the fact that there are so many considerations is the technical challenge really. And as brands wading through, making, I guess, what we try to do at least is make the best decision we can with the information we have at the time and just continue to improve. I was just going to say, Francis, I think you're absolutely right. I think the technical challenges from a packaging point of view, not only do they change all the time, but I think you have to do you. You have to decide, you have to put the line in the sand at that particular moment. And what do you feel is right? And what are the changes that you can make? Because as you said, there's the swirl of the conversation will always change and there's always going to be something better and something more sustainable, which is great. But at the time when you are launching a brand, you do have to make a decision and that is what's available and how that makes you feel what you know, what you can rest with in, in terms of making those decisions. When we launched our own brand, our Beautiful Thinking Room Scent, we had to make those decisions too. And it's a much smaller scale. All the profits go to a charity, but we wanted to see if that's how it feels by um, ourselves in our client's shoes, by launching a brand and looking at what's available, recycled glass. One of the things I think with fragrance, I wanted to make sure that it was refillable. And that was a really hard task by finding the sourcing, the pump that is easy to unscrew because of a lot of fragrances you have that crimped neck that you can't separate those components. So all of those challenges that we had to find along the way, and I thought it was really interesting to see. And actually, you have to put a lot of time and effort into all of that, much more than I thought, than I predicted. I think for clients thinking about going into that space, you have to dedicate a lot of time and do a lot of homework in researching what is the best things that are available and then deciding how you feel as a brand, what you feel comfortable with launching. Just thinking about meeting consumer expectations, Nick, what mm. are the environmental challenges and where are the opportunities that Free the Birds have tracked for circular fragrance products? It's a really interesting one. I feel that from, the, from our experience, and we're also, just as a sideline, we're also registering ourselves as a business for B Corp, and that's really got me through the lens and thinking about being much more local with how we produce and the resources that we can achieve. And I think it does make your mindset 
much more on the area, the neighborhood that you live and where you can produce rather than thinking mass, rather than thinking global. So I think that I'm really interested in brands that have that localization, building on where it's produced. Is it, is it in their own premises? Is it a, an industry ne near them? Is it supporting the local environment? Is it giving back in some way to the local areas? And I think that that for me is something that we can all identify with. Hunt has talked about storytelling and that is so entrenched in frequencies. And we love stories. We love to hear about brands that are doing good in some way and making adjustments for the better. And, but I think that that is such a hard area in a way for us all to grasp. But I think the opportunity is to keep it local to have those conversations on a local level. Um, and that's where I think that um, there's a real opportunity uh, to bring that in through the environmental challenges. And Francis, is local the way forward for ABLE? Because as you said before, you are a global brand. Yeah, again, I'll use the word nuance, right? We, so I founded the business in Amsterdam, 10 year anniversary this month, actually. And we moved the business from Amsterdam to Wellington, New Zealand, uh, three and a half years ago. So just before COVID. And so we've, in a way, me being a New Zealander, starting the business in Amsterdam, I think we've always had a very global mindset. Uh, we are a niche product. So, you know, we don't want to be selling in dozens of stores in a city really in order to scale. And we're certainly not the only brand with this approach. You do want to be in the world's best cities and you want to be recognized around the world. So I guess that's a brand decision for us. And we also know our customer. Uh, that is what our customer is an urban customer. They travel, they're worldly and Arbel is part of that lifestyle. So I guess from a brand decision, we are a global business, uh, but from a, from a team and philosophical decision, I think I really learned when I moved the business back to New Zealand, I think going from being an expat founder to a founder in a community here, um, the difference for me has been quite profound. You know, we took over an old bakery in Wellington here and we transformed it into uh, we call it our fabric, uh, the Dutch word for factory. So a little uh, perfume factory here in Wellington. And we try to build, because I think community, you can define sustainability and ethics, social responsibility in so many ways. I think at the heart of it is community. And it's together what's the kind of local and global community we're trying to build. We're always trying to find that balance of where we do a lot of amazing community initiatives down to things like beach cleanups, you know, where we all get up with our sacks and pick up rubber alongside the community to like some very kind of global minded decisions and things around you know, ingredients that we believe should be banned in the industry. So for us, it's just balancing those two. And when sourcing ingredients, Francis, are you local or are you global? We are global. And so very much. When you're working with a natural palette, you already have a much reduced palette from a synthetic palette. So if there's 5,000 synthetic um, ingredients to play with, there's uh, maybe 10% of naturals. And that's growing with the biotech, but again, a lot of that biotech's happening. Some of our ingredients, New York, uh, Germany, you know, we're the real state art, art biotech laboratories are based. So. For us, it's really about finding the very best ingredients because we want to make truly world-class perfume. But to that point, we also have some experimentation happening in our own little laboratory. Uh, we've taken recently some cacao husks from a local uh, chocolate factory here in Wellington where we're um, playing around with some tinctures. We've been talking with a local brewery who's just opposite us in the kind of little village in Wellington where we are um, and looking at can we do some byproduct stuff with them. So again, it's that kind of local meets global. Yeah. There's some great stories there, Francis, isn't there? There's some yeah. great stories <laughs> to tell and great insights. And I honestly think that's where the opportunities lie in reducing emissions through sustainable sourcing and production. We, we also want to design compostable, recycled packaging and adopting much more natural and safe fragrance in the, the actual ingredients themselves. Those are the stories that we need to unpick. And those are the stories that we need our consumers to hear because they are very rich in that dialogue. And I think that that's something particularly in fragrance that we can all work on and they're the stories that everybody does want to hear and that's why I think that 
supporting the heartland of where your brand has come from. Yes, you are using resources around the globe, but it's, there's that heart, that beating heart of where it is. And that's the community that you're building as a brand, which I think is vital to, to brands that are in this circular world. Yeah, I also think perhaps just to add on the ingredients, we're not shipping, if you look at ingredients, they're very high value, small volume export. So some of the ingredients, our better beer from Haiti, for example, it's a super expensive, small volume export for the Haitian community. It's a really important revenue generator, you know, so it's also um, a lot of fragrance ingredients are actually very valuable exports for a lot of uh, developing nations that rely on that income, they rely on uh, really strong partnerships with buyers in the fragrance industry. So it's also, again, it's that, is it carbon footprint or is it facilitating uh, social security in some of the regions that, that really depend on it? Yeah. Again, it's not simple, right? Absolutely. Indeed, it's not. But Nick, can you discuss the regulatory challenges and the opportunities that Free the Birds have identified for circular fragrance products? Sure. It's, it's slightly outside of our realm, but um, one of the things that I'm really surprised about is I would love to see more transparency. I'd love to know what the carbon footprint of the brands are like if I need to find that information. There doesn't seem to be any certification around that. We know that there's a huge amount of greenwashing. So I think the regulatory challenges, I think, should be brought forward to consumers. And I feel that we should know what's really behind them, um, particularly in this sphere of um, talking about circular fragrances. I want to know about the carbon footprint. I want to know how the brand is performing. So yeah, I'm over to Francis on the regulatory challenges. It's not something that I'm too, too familiar with, but I'd love to hear. Yeah, Frances, for your brand, what are the regulatory challenges? You discussed that you are you sell globally and you highlighted a, earlier that even in the US, from state to state, there are different challenges. Yeah, look, I think it's that balance, right? No one wants to be drowning in paperwork, but do you think brands and their suppliers will need to do a lot of legwork in order for this to be simple for consumers? Now that we talked at the start, it's so difficult as a consumer, you know, maybe it's not the first thing you're thinking about when you think about perfume. So if we can break things down into languages that is language that's easily digestible for consumers, I think that's great. The one thing I would say there is you know, there's a plethora of certifications and, and increasing the number of certifications doesn't necessarily make things easier for consumers. You'd, ideally, you'd have a, one international framework with a very clear kind of matrix structure um, that we could all understand and abide by. But in the meantime, and, and perhaps that will come, I mean, look, the fragrance companies have been very good, I think, at dealing with EFRA and the, the rules around allergens that came into force pretty well, it just did. It's not a legal requirement. Retailers are demanded and brand uh, stick to it. So I think there's definitely a precedent for doing some kind of global framework. Until then, it's messy. I definitely think it is messy and it's messy for brands and it's messy for consumers as well. But one of my big things is transparency. So I'm really happy you mentioned it, Nick. No, there is just zero transparency in the fragrance industry. I and mean, historically, that was always, it's the perfumer's a recipe. You shouldn't have to share your ingredients list. And I think we all know that just doesn't stand up these days. And anyone can, you know, with a mass spectrometer, can break down a fragrance formula. I think that no longer stands up. Um, and I think customers do deserve to know what's in their perfume and I think if there was transparency a lot of those questions around you know natural synthetic good bad would be answered to an extent if we were just all a little bit honest and I use the example quite often I come from the wine industry so my background was winemaking so I'm often referencing food and wine and wine it's right down to the appellation and that's so important the origin of ingredients and you think if you sold someone a bottle of truffle oil um, that was a truffle oil flavored, not real truffle oil, and you palmed one off as the other, how upset would you be as a customer? The difference in price is huge. Uh, and it's the same with perfume. You know, if you're using real iris or you're using iris, I want to say flavor, but a synthetic iris, it shouldn't be 
called the same thing. Personally, I think there's a lot that needs to change in the industry around transparency. And I think it will. Just to both of you, should it be a governmental decision or should it be an industry body? What do you think would work best? Nick? I feel it should be an industry body. I think that who's got the time to to wait for government? To, of course, that would be wonderful, but we need to gear it up. And I think brands need to lead by example. And I think they, they are getting, getting the industry behind this is the first port of call. And for you, Francis, what would make it easier as a small independent brand? Well, yeah, I totally agree. And look, perhaps the EU could drive something forward that doesn't help you guys. But I think it has to be industry. Also for brand, you know, it's, it's so difficult already dealing with different legislation per country. I think if it can be driven by the industry, it can be truly global, which is in everybody's favour. Okay. And lastly, Nick, what does progress look like in a year's time? I really love that talk about um, transparency. And Francis, I love your analogy with the wine. And you're, you're part of the whole wine world. And I think it's such a great analogy with fragrance. So I think that transparency, I'm hoping that there's going to be a lot more transparency that's coming in the next 12 months and beyond. I still think there's low awareness and I think there's a massive education piece that, that brands and brands like Francis's brand has that unique positioning to be that educator. And I hope that that's going to come through um, in the next 12 months. Um, so I, th I definitely think that breaking down that mystique of the fragrance world and the fragrances behind it. It's quite interesting, actually, if you just step back and think about fragrance, it's all been built on mystique. The whole industry has been built slightly some smoke and mirrors. And I think that's why it's so hard to now gear into a circular world of thinking about transparency, honesty, and being that clear communicator with our consumers. So I think that for me is the heart of all of this discussion about being really honest talking about where the products are, where the um, ingredients are coming from, what's in them, what effect that has. And I said that has a really interesting right to play within fragrance. I feel that there's a lot of swirl around skincare and hair and all of those things. And I feel that area, there's quite a lot of chat, but I think with fragrances, I think that's why I think this peeling, this layer of transparency is going to be really, really vital uh, to really open up the discussion um, within local fragrances. And Francis, for your brand, what does progress look like in the next 12 months? Yeah, I have so much to say on this. As you were talking about transparency, Nick, you know, like we talk about the only way we'll remedy the gender pay gap is by, you know, everybody and having to be open about their pay scales. And I think while things are hidden, anything can happen, I think. So Really making uh, that transparency or that move towards transparency, I think, is so key. I'm a positive kind of thinker. I have a lot of faith that, that we're on the right track and that things are moving. In the time I've been working on Arbor, we've seen so much traction. You know, when I started out, we didn't talk hardly about the fact it was natural because it wasn't cool and people didn't want to know that. And now we've come to a point where we have customers literally emailing us and saying, how do I recycle your bottle? Um, where does this, where does this, I saw this ingredient because we list our full ingredients list on a website. I saw that you use Ambrita lead. I thought that was synthetic. So can you tell me about it? And we reply saying, yeah, ours is a plant derived, same molecule, um, but from a plant. So I think the customers are there and, and we see it every day. The customers want it. So I think if nothing else, that will drive the industry forward. And then I genuinely see the convers and hear the conversations I have with people in the industry. And we all want to do better, I think. We're, the car industry is moving away from petrochemicals. The fragrance industry can't stay hooked to them forever. I think it will change and, and I think it's changing quickly. And with that, I would like to thank my guests, Nick and Francis, for joining me today and to you for listening. 